Do you think in React? One of the greatest things about React is how it makes you think about apps as you build them. In this video, we'll walk through the process of building a searchable product data table using React. All of the code for each step will be linked in the description below. Help me out by liking this video and subscribing if you haven't already. And really quick before we get into it, today's video is sponsored by Atlantic.net. Atlantic.net provides great VPS hosting and they are offering a free one gig virtual server with SSDs and block storage for free for a year, plus $25 in free credits to use for other services they offer if you use the link in the description below. It's super easy to use. After I signed up, I was able to provision a new server in less than 30 seconds. They also have incredible reliability and redundancy on their servers. So try Atlantic.net to develop, test, or launch your next project. Click the link in the description below and use the code STACKER to get your $25 in credit. So let's start with the basics. Many times you might get a mock-up from a designer, and then you'll get the JSON API from your backend developer. Here's what the mock-up looks like, and here's what the JSON data looks like. So the first step is to break the UI into components. First, draw boxes around every component and subcomponent in the mockup and give them all names. The designer may have already completed this for you. The layer names from their design software may end up being the names of your React components. But how do you know what should be its own component? The best way to do this is by using a technique called the single responsibility principle. This basically means that a component should ideally only do one thing. Anytime a component grows larger than that, it should be decomposed into smaller subcomponents. You'll generally be working with JSON data, so separate your UI into components where each component matches one piece of your data model. So here we see the mockup broken down into five components. We have the filterable product table. This wraps the entire app. Then we have the search bar. This will be the user input. Next is the product table. This displays and filters data based on user input. The product category row is the headings for each category. And then the product row is each product. And now that we've identified each component, let's arrange them into a hierarchy. At the top, we'll have the filterable product table, and then the search bar, and then the product table. Within the product table, we have the product category row and the product row. The second step is to build a static version. So now that we have our component hierarchy, it's time to start writing some code. The easiest way to get started is to build a version that renders the data and UI, but has no interactivity. You can build top down or bottom up. That means that you can either start with the top of the hierarchy with filterable product table and work your way down, or you can start at the bottom with product row and work your way up. With simple apps, it's usually easier to go top down, but on larger projects, it's easier to go bottom up and write tests as you build. We're going to start from the bottom with the product row. So we'll create a functional component which will be passed props. The props will include the product and all of its data. So we'll first get the product, then we'll get the name, but remember that in our mockup, there were names that were colored red, and this is because these products are not in stock. So on the product, we will need a stocked property. Then we can use a ternary operator to decide whether we need to add custom styling to the name. And finally, we'll return a table row with the product's name and price. Next, we'll build the product category row component. This will also be passed props. The prop that we'll need here is the category of the product. Then we'll return a table row with the category spanning two columns. Now for the product table, which will again be passed props, we'll need to keep track of the rows and the last category. We'll loop through each product which is passed from our props, and if the product category is not equal to the last product's category, then we'll add a new category row using our product category row component. We'll pass to that component the category and use the category as a key. If the category was already used, then this will not be called. Next, we'll push the product to the product row component, passing the product and using the name as the key. Now we'll set the last category to equal the current product's category. And lastly, we'll return the table with the row. Next, we'll build the search bar component. This will return a form with a text input and a checkbox input. And finally, we'll create the filterable product table component, 
which will simply return the search bar and the product table components, and we'll also pass the products to the product table component. And of course, we'll render these to the DOM, passing our JSON data to the filterable product table component. Now we should see a static representation of the app. The third step is to find the minimal representation of state. To build an app correctly, we need to identify the minimal complete representation of UI state our app requires. I like to use the dry design principle. Don't repeat yourself. If you find yourself typing the same things multiple times, then there must be a way to combine those. Figure out the absolute minimal representation of the state your application needs and compute everything else you need on demand. And here's an example. If you build a to-do list, keep an array of the to-do items, but don't keep a separate state variable for the count. Instead, when you want to render the to-do count, take the length of the to-do items array. So think of all of the pieces of data in our example application. We have the original list of products, the search text the user has entered, the value of the checkbox, and the filtered list of products. So let's go through each one and figure out which one is state. To do this, ask three questions about each piece of data. Answering yes to any of these means that it's probably not state. Is it passed in from a parent via props? Does it remain unchanged over time? Can you compute it based on any other state or props in your component? The original list of products is passed in as props, so it's not state. The search text and the checkbox are state because they change over time and can't be computed from anything. And the filtered list of products isn't state because it can be computed by combining the original list of products with the search text and value of the checkbox. So this is our state that we need to track the search text the user has entered, and the value of the checkbox. The fourth step is figuring out where the state should live. So let's identify which component mutates or owns our state. Now remember that React uses one-way data flow down the component hierarchy. It may not be immediately clear which component should own what state, and this can be challenging for beginners. So follow these steps for each piece of state in the application. Identify every component that renders something based on the state. Find a common owner component, a single component above all the components that need the state in the hierarchy. Either the common owner or another component higher up in the hierarchy should own the state. If you can't find a component where it makes sense to own the state, create a new component just for holding the state and add it to the hierarchy above the common owner component. So let's run through this strategy for our application product table needs to filter the product list based on state and search bar needs to display the search text and checked state. The common owner component is filterable product table. So it makes sense for the filter text and the checked value to live in filterable product table. Awesome. Now that our state lives in filterable product table, we'll use the use state hook to create a filter text and in stock only states. Then we'll pass filter text and in stock only to product table and search bar as props. And finally, we'll use these props to filter the rows in product table and set the values of the form fields in search bar. You can start seeing how our application will behave. We could set filter text to ball in our filterable product table component state and refresh the app. You would see that the data table is updated correctly. The fifth and final step is to add inverse data flow. So far, we've built an app that renders correctly as a function of props and state flowing down the hierarchy. Now it's time to support data flowing the other way. The form components deep in the hierarchy need to update the state in filterable product table. React makes this data flow explicit to help you understand how your program works, but it does require a little more typing than traditional two-way data binding. If you try to type or check the box in the current version of the example, you'll see that React ignores your input. This is intentional as we've set the value prop of the input to always be equal to the state passed in from filterable product table. Let's think about what we want to happen. We want to make sure that whenever the user changes the form, we update the state to reflect the user input. Since components should only update their own state, Filterable product table will pass the use state hooks setter function to search bar that will fire whenever the state should be updated. 
we can use the on change event on the inputs to call the filterable product tables states setter functions and the app will be updated. And that's all there is to thinking in React. Hopefully this gives you an idea of how to think about building components and applications with React. While it may be a little bit more typing than you're used to, remember that code is read far more than it's written and it's less difficult to read this modular explicit code. As you start to build larger libraries of components, you'll appreciate this explicitness and modularity. And with code reuse, your lines of code will start to shrink. As a bonus, we're going to style this application using Tailwind CSS. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the details of Tailwind, but you can take a look at the documentation, which is very detailed. Basically, Tailwind is a utility-first CSS framework. It's low level and provides all of the basic building blocks. We can simply add predefined classes to our markup and not have to write a single line of CSS. Let me show you how it works. We'll start in the filterable product table component. On the main div, we're going to add these classes. Flex, which displays this as flex. Flex column sets the flex direction to column. PT10 is padding top. Items center is align items center. Min H screen is minimum height screen, which would be 100 VH. W full is width 100%. BG gray 900 sets the background to a dark gray. And then text white is pretty self-explanatory. Then on our H1, we'll add these classes, text 3XL, that makes the text three times larger, and then font bold, and then MB5 is margin bottom five. Now for the search bar component, we'll add these classes, shadow, appearance none, border none, rounded, W full, PY2, that's padding on the Y axis, top and bottom. PX3 is padding on the X axis, so that's left and right. MB is margin bottom. And then we're gonna set the background to a little bit of a lighter gray, leading tight, focus outline none, focus shadow outline. And for the checkbox, we'll add MR2, that's margin right and leading tight. And lastly, we'll wrap the checkbox text in a span with the class of text SM, which stands for text small. Next, the product table components table will get these classes, table fixed, LGW one third. So that's on a large screen, we want to set the width to one third. On a medium screen, MD, we want the width again to be one third. On a small screen, we want the width to be one half, and then MY5 margin top and bottom. The table rows will get border B, which is border bottom, a border T, border top, and we'll set the border color to a gray. The name column will get these classes, width half, padding on the X axis of four, padding on the Y axis of two, and text align left. Then the price column will be very similar. The only difference here is that the text align is set to right. Now for the product category row component, we'll add these classes, text orange, background gray, border bottom, border gray, and padding on the Y axis of two. And lastly, the product row components table row will get border and bottom and the border color of gray. The name column will get a padding all around of one, and the price column will get a padding all around of one and a text align of right. So in conclusion, React is very powerful and can be easy to write when you think in React. Adding Tailwind CSS to React makes adding CSS styles simple and super easy. Let me know what you think. Again, all of the code for each step will be linked in the description below. Help me out by liking this video and subscribing if you haven't already for more videos like this.